Today, Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m. in the library activity room of the Flint Memorial Library, we have the Granite Kiss, Traditions and Techniques of Building New England Stone Walls by Kevin Gardner. Kevin Gardner will explain how and why New England came to acquire its thousands of miles of stone walls and the ways which they and other dry stone structures were built, how their styles emerged and changed over time, and their significance to the New England landscape. Along the way, he'll build a miniature wall on a tabletop using stones. Welcome everybody this evening to our program with Kevin Gardner, the author of The Granite Kiss, and the director, Helena Minton. I'm very pleased to see you all here. just want to thank the friends for sponsoring this. Without further ado, welcome Kevin Gardner, who's come from New Hampshire, and we're going to talk about building stone walls. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to see that bubble talk. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, I want to thank Elena, and I want to thank the friends for uh, sponsoring this tonight. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, just a little bit of an introduction. Um, my name, as you know now, is Kevin Gardner. I'm a, um, I'm an New Hampshireite, uh, born and raised in Hopkinton, which is a little bit west of Concord, uh, north of here. I began to build stone walls in the early 1970s, and I was taught by my uncle, um, who was a farmer and a, a member of the New Hampshire legislature. I'm not sure if you know this, but the New Hampshire legislature uh, is so large that uh, most of us have a family member in it. Um, uh, and my uncle is uh, ours. Um, the, uh, to clarify, for any of you who are not sure about this, the stone walls I'm going to talk about tonight are what we call dry stone walls, which is to say they are put together without adhesives of any kind, without mortars, <coughs> an ancient, old-fashioned way of putting walls together, and I suspect that most of you know that this is true already, but you would be surprised at how many times I go through this entire spiel, and the first question that I get is, why isn't there any mortar between uh, the stones? Uh, the second thing I want to uh, tell you is uh, something that my publisher gets angry with me about, because my book is titled The Granite Kiss, which makes it sound uh, romantic. Uh, <laughs> granite kiss is not a romantic thing. It's what you get when you smash your fingers between two stones. <laughs> 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 um, third disclaimer, I suppose, is about what I'm going to do on this table. Uh, if you are sitting near the back and you can't see very well what's happening here, don't worry about it. I'm not going to do anything very important here um, in terms of what it is I want to tell you tonight. Um, but I stumbled on this a few years ago, uh, and I have to admit, it tends to help people's attention, but for me, I'm really only trying to keep my hands busy. There's absolutely nothing I'm doing on this table that is critically important to what I'm uh, going to talk to you. When I'm talking to you, and I'm going to rattle on for maybe a half an hour or 40 minutes or so, but the real fun of these talks with me uh, is speaking with you, answering any questions you have, or letting you bring me back to things that I've gone over a little too quickly, or things I may have skipped uh, in terms of history and technique, or even something that you might be interested in in terms of projects that you have taken on on your own properties, or things that you've seen uh, around New England. Um, uh, that are made of dry stone. I'm going to talk a little bit about history. I'm going to talk a little bit about technique. Uh, and then I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, aesthetics. There is a great deal that can be said about uh, our New England stone walls. And I know you'll be pleased and relieved to hear that I'm not going to make any particular effort to say all of it to you. We would be here for a very long time if I did. The stone walls have been so important to New England's history, not only in terms of the way the landscape looks, but also in terms of uh, the way that it has developed over time. And I'll talk a little bit about how the styles of stonework have changed 
uh, as time has gone by. Uh, and then, again, I want to uh, turn this over to you so that right, please. Uh, you can direct this conversation to places that are, the, are, are more interesting to you. I'm going to begin by talking about a important year uh, in the history of New England stone walls. Um, that year was 1871. In 1871, our beloved federal government, which then as now likes to keep itself busy, decided to measure all the fencing in the United States of America. It delegated this critically important job to the Department of Agriculture. It took them about a year. You know, the country was a little bit smaller in 1871 than it is now, uh, but not a whole lot. At the end of that year, they produced a report that, among many other things, concluded that in the six New England states and the state of New York, there were more than 250,000 miles of stone walls. 250,000 miles. That's enough stone wall to go to the moon. It's enough stone wall to go around the world ten times. Ten times. It is so much stone wall that later people who became fascinated by this statistic concluded, among other things, that in order to build this much stone wall, it would have taken 15,000 builders working day and night, year-round, 243 years, to build everything that had been created. That, of course, was only 15,000 builders. This makes the uh, uh, point that's very important about our old stone walls, because, you know, we tend to think of them as the creations of master builders of one kind or another who were, who were in charge of or who were keeping uh, important secrets about, a, uh, about an arcane method of putting things together. The truth, of course, is that stone walls for them, for the people who built this immense uh, network of walls over New, all over New England, this kind of work was very ordinary, daily work. It wasn't much more significant in terms of artistry or, or specialized knowledge than cleaning a barn out or any other little task that uh, is associated with uh, living on a farm or working the land here in New England, which I don't have to remind you is a rather stony part of the world. Like any other ordinary task, building stone walls, for them, again, not for us, We've, our attitude of course has changed considerably uh, as time has gone. <coughs> This, um, uh, this craft, you might call it, had its great geniuses, people who, were, who, who had a, a wonderful temperament for it, and who uh, studied it and, and worked at their techniques. And it had its idiots, people who really had no notion of how to put a wall together that would last you know, even a year or two, much less uh, 200 years or more. And then they had the, a vast million, perhaps 70, 75 percent, 80 percent of the people who actually did it, who knew the basics of the task and were fairly competent at it, but were not great masons. Um, these are the people who were responsible for uh, a great deal of what we still have left here. Now, one other reason that this date, 1871, is quite significant in the history of New England stone walls is that by that date, we were already beginning to lose some of the stone walls that had been built up over generations by these uh, New England farmers. The reason for that was because of changes in the technology of agriculture that occurred during the mid-19th century. Now, that I'm sure you're probably familiar from traveling around the countryside with the kind of patterning that stone walls are created all over the New England landscape. It's a pattern of fairly small fields set off in rectangles generally or squares and um, one of the things that's really striking, if you find yourself in an area that has it still has its original network, or most of its original network of uh, 18th and, and early 19th century walls, is how small those fields are. And that is actually a reflection of the techniques of farming that were first brought here in the 17th century uh, by settlers who were the ones who broke out most of this land in the first place. They're the ones who created this pattern. And that pattern was essentially based on what one man could do on a particular piece of land in one day. This is part of the way that we derive our notion of an acre. Uh, and so uh, the, the uh, pattern that developed uh, 
in the early days uh, in terms of our fencing, our stone walls, was a pattern of, of one and two and three and five acre fields. Those were easier to work in an era when everything was being done by hand. But by the middle of the 19th century, agricultural technology had become, had already be, uh, started to become mechanized. And so, uh, just to give you one illustration of that, suppose you are mowing a field that's two or three acres and it's nicely set off with walls that have square corners. Um, because it's a series of squares with little rectangles. Well, if you're, if you're using a side, you can walk right up to the walls that bind it and literally cut every blade of grass that comes right to the um, right to the edge of the wall. But if you're suddenly hauling a 10-foot cutter bar behind a pair of horses, you've got to start turning 15 or 20 feet before you even get to that corner. Therefore, you are, um, all of a sudden, you have triangles of, of useless space uh, in your walled-off square fields. Um, and so by 1871, when um, uh, farming had become much more mechanized than it had ever been before, those little fields um, uh, bound up by walls were turning into something that was holding farmers back from getting maximum productivity on their land. And so they themselves began to pull their own walls down and in many cases dump them into trenches that they dug alongside them. So there are now thousands of miles of buried stone walls in the enlarged older fields uh, here in New England. And that, was, uh, that process was well underway by 1871 when this report was first put together. So it's at least likely, if not uh, certain, that uh, that figure of 250,000 miles that was arrived at at that date was actually somewhat less than what had once existed at the, uh, at the heyday of the building of stone walls. That heyday is another kind of interesting statistic uh, or fact about how we acquired all these stone walls because in historical terms we got them awfully quickly. There's been one uh, estimate that the majority of New England's uh, agricultural dry stone walls were built in about a 50-year period, especially in the southern part of the region, between about 1775 and about 1825, uh, which is a good uh, broad um, uh, measure of what we might call the peak of small subsistence agricultural farming on a family-by-family -family basis here uh, in New England. That um, that timeline for the construction of most of our walls is even shorter if you think about northern New England, the three northern states, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Uh, there, it is compressed into about a 30-year period from about 1810 to about 1840. Now, does that mean that all the walls were built during that time? No, we were constructing walls long, long before that. Um, but that <coughs> frenzy of wall building uh, really coincides with the uh, most active part, the most active uh, period of uh, New England building because that is when we uh, began to really prosper as an agricultural area. By 1871, however, the long decline of New England's small agriculture was already well underway. It was aggravated by uh, economic decline that was related to the opening of the West there were a lot of boys who left New England farms to go fight in the Civil War who discovered that there were parts of this country where uh, the um, topsoil was six feet deep instead of six inches deep. And um, uh, they stayed in Ohio, or they went back there with their families when the war was over. We had a major emptying out uh, of the agricultural uh, uh, community in this part of the country, starting in the late 19th century and extending well into the uh, 20th. And so. Um, for all intents and purposes, the, uh, the constant production of new uh, agricultural stone walls and old-time uh, building was really coming to a, to a close by the time that this measurement uh, was done in 1871. So that, makes, that also makes this a significant date because it's a date that uh, not only marks uh, the passing of a particular kind of era, uh, but it also uh, gives us a very good idea of how much once stood. Um, people have become fascinated by some of these numbers. One guy who um, couldn't let it go decided that uh, on a volume basis the amount of stonework in the New England states uh, exceeded um, all the rest of the dry stonework that had ever been built anywhere in the world <laughs> on a volume basis. And it's kind of hard to argue with him um, when you think of exactly how much uh, there must once have been. And of course, we still see um, 
uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles of old stone walls, even after all these years of redevelopment and, and the simple act of uh, the walls uh, falling down. One of the myths, of course, of old stone walls is that once they are built, they remain in place uh, more or less forever. This is uh, manifestly not true, especially uh, to anyone who has ever attempted to build one. You know that um, uh, that famous poem by Robert Frost, for instance, uh, about mending the wall. Uh, uh, what is often unremarked on uh, in that poem is that Frost makes it clear that the repair of the wall was an annual activity. It was not something that had to be done only every once in a while. It was something that had to be done every single year. Uh, and so, uh, walls are not quite in reality as uh, as permanent and stable as they may seem, uh, even though the materials from which they're made are um, uh, quite long-lasting, uh, as you know. Well, why is it that the uh, folks who put together the New England landscape and farmed it for so many generations uh, decided to settle on walls, on stone, uh, as their primary means of fencing? They didn't start out that way. Um, farmers are not idiots. They don't want to do any more uh, work than they have to to achieve the desired uh, result of their labor. And so when they began, you know, when um, uh, any given area would be first uh, broken out for settlement, uh, they would tend to go to places where uh, the land was not particularly stony, down the river bottoms, of course, and uh, in places where Native Americans had already been practicing their own version of, of somewhat uh, more casual uh, agriculture. but. Uh, the fields were already broken out, or areas where corn could be planted, and so forth. But those were used up very quickly, and the population in um, uh, the population of Europeans and other settlers uh, in this part of the country grew fast because this is a healthy place to live, uh, and so more land was needed very quickly. And I'm talking now about um, a, a spell of about 100 to 150 years before the revolution. Uh, when especially down here in Massachusetts, settlement was moving quite rapidly in from the in from the um, coasts and up the rivers uh, into areas where uh, Native Americans had done much less farming and the forest was still in charge. Well, this pushed settlement into um, uh, more and more areas that had not been farmed in any way, and that is when farms began to move into the hillier country, and then they began to discover uh, that they had a lot of stone on their hands. Now, their first choice for fencing, uh, especially in early settlement days, actually wasn't stone, which takes a certain amount of time to work with. It has to be gathered, brought to a place, and so on and so forth. Um, what they tended to make their fences with in the earliest days was um, out of organics, out of brush and stumps, and anything that they could pile up relatively quickly. One thing that happened, however, as time went on, uh, was that these settlers discovered that the, uh, what they had thought of as the endless forest of New England, you see all kinds of writing about this, uh, especially from the Puritans who believed, uh, or seemed to believe, that uh, the, the woods of New England were, were virtually limitless, would never run out, were um, uh, something that was um, almost as vast as the ocean, except made of wood. Um, uh, and so uh, it was kind of a surprise to them as they began to develop the countryside to realize that their um, activities tended to use up the wood in a certain uh, uh, you know, area uh, much faster than they thought. And so one of the reasons that they began to build with stone was because in many places, after settlement had gone on for a generation or two, they started running out of wood. And of course, these people used wood for everything they did. They built their houses with it, they hewed, they burned enormous amounts of it uh, for fuel. Uh, so, on about the, in many areas, even before the revolution, they ran into a problem with having to uh, uh, conserve forest resources. In the meantime, especially in hilly places, uh, or stonier places, where they had begun to pick surface stone away uh, in order to create fields and pastures and places where they could mow, uh, they realized that they had already been stockpiling large amounts of stone alongside these uh, organic fencing that they had put together of stumps and brush and so on. So in many places, for instance, a zigzag split rail fence, which was a very quick way to put together fencing, would accumulate um, uh, a kind of low mounded windrow of discarded stone along its line. Um, 
the great uh, author illustrator Eric Sloan has some wonderful drawings where he illustrates how this uh, process worked. Eventually, of course, the stone uh, accumulated enough to become a wall by itself. Now, these were hardly uh, the, the put-together, uh, well-placed stone walls that we are used to seeing now in so much of New England, but they were the beginning uh, of that great network uh, of boundaries and fencing that eventually became uh, so common to us here in New England. As time went on, uh, and uh, their skills increased, because of course these people in many instances were not stonemasons when they first arrived here. Uh, they had to turn themselves into that uh, as time went on. Uh, they, uh, uh, the combination of the availability of huge amounts of stone and the fact that they had to get rid of it, they had to put it somewhere uh, in order to get it out of their own way, uh, made them, uh, develop them into uh, the stonemasons that we have come to uh, come to know and revere today. So this process, although it happened in historical terms in a relatively uh, short amount of time, certainly had stages to it. The last thing that happened, or had happened, at the time when the survey that um, showed us how, just how much wall work had been done uh, here in New England, uh, was another technological invention, and that was the development of barbed wire. Barbed wire was invented in 1868, just before, a few years before the survey was done. They made some technical improvements to it, but the appearance of barbed wire coincided with a de-emphasis in New England agriculture on the raising of sheep, uh, and a renewed emphasis, or, a, or rather a, um, an increased emphasis on, on uh, raising dairy cattle. By now, uh, transport of uh, uh, fresh goods to market uh, via railroad and other means uh, had become uh, quite common and that meant that you could have a dairy up in New Hampshire and Warner perhaps and sell your milk in Boston, a thing that had been impossible before. Uh, so this helped um, uh, a lot of New England, uh, northern New England farmers to switch over to dairy. Uh, cows of course are easily contained by barbed wire, which is a little bit less uh, uh, convenient uh, when you're talking about keeping sheep. This also contributed to uh, a real uh, slowdown um, in the, uh, the building of new stone walls. Now, you know, in history, very few things uh, change everything all at once. This is about as close as you can get uh, to knowing when we, were in the pro when we were in the business of building many, many stone walls all the time, uh, and then uh, relatively suddenly uh, we not only stopped building them all the time, but we began to uh, take them apart. And that's really the significance of that 1871 uh, survey, which simultaneously showed us just exactly um, how much, or, or relatively, um, how much stonework had been done, but also occurred in a moment when uh, the, the old craft of doing it all the time on every farm uh, was, was rapidly fading away. By the time we switched to the, over to the 20th century, Something else happened here in New England, and this we should be grateful for, even though it wasn't much fun for the people who had to live through it. That is that <coughs> New England as a region entered a long period uh, of terrible decline, both economically and, and really culturally. You know, by the beginning of the 20th century, magazine articles were appearing saying, what's wrong with New England? It had become a kind of, sort of the Appalachia, uh, in, in a way, of uh, the United States it was considered slow and backward, and um, there were lots of jokes about uh, <coughs> uh, uh, families marrying each other up in the dreadful hills of uh, uh, old New England. Uh, but the uh, upshot is that very few people were settling in here anymore, and the, the loss of uh, the vibrant culture that we had had before, one that was based on small subsistence farming, was a thing that was being lamented everywhere. This actually, uh, this condition did not really begin to improve until the Great Depression. You know, it's been argued, especially in my state, uh, New Hampshire, that uh, the Depression was actually very good uh, for parts of New England, not so much because it was, uh, it resulted in any uh, terrific improvement, as that it dragged the rest of the country back to where New England had been for many years, <laughs> uh, and therefore equalized <laughs> the playing field. Uh, but that's, that's uh, the reputation that New England now has um, uh, of being a 
a, a good place, a healthy place, a, a place uh, that's a great place to raise your family, a good place to live. That reputation really begins to be promulgated um, uh, as a uh, as an attraction uh, in the middle of the 1930s and on into past the World War II and so forth. You know, my own state, uh, New Hampshire, had a marketing campaign. Um, just after the turn of the 20th century, when they were trying to, they were trying to sell off some of the old abandoned farms to people who wanted to move out of cities, and so they began to call uh, New Hampshire the Switzerland of America. Um, there was an association of uh, with Switzerland as being a place of honest, hardworking uh, uh, people, um, and there was a bit of a, uh, there was a, a sort of vague implication of racial purity there too, because of course Switzerland is so so white, so New England began to present itself as a kind of uh, alternative to the dirty, um, uh, booming, and unhealthy uh, cities uh, filled with immigrants and people who spoke foreign languages and so on and so forth. This became a, uh, a, uh, a kind of calling card uh, of the resurgence of New England and the building of stone walls and all the integrity that was supposed to uh, be associated with that. Uh, was very much a part of that campaign. Well, one of the reasons that this gold decline was rather good for New England, at least from our standpoint, is that because so little development took place in the countryside during the decades between, oh, say, uh, 1871 uh, and about 1935 or 40, an, an enormous amount of the older stonework that we have in the countryside was preserved because nothing came along to take its place. Uh, and so many of these little towns, like my town, like uh, towns like Warner, and Alexandria, and New Hampshire, many, many towns in Maine and Vermont, which have lost more than a quarter of its population during the great emptying out, did not return to their 1830s population until well into the 1970s or 80s. And this means that lots of areas of the countryside that have been very well developed in terms of their stonework and the old farms that were existing there simply remained in place because nothing ever came along to take them down. So we have a great deal of older stonework uh, still hidden away in a lot of these areas, although now that um, uh, new redevelopment has moved back in, uh, we're losing it again at a fairly uh, substantial rate. But it stayed around long enough for us to study it and get to know it uh, and for it to become a kind of symbol of what the region actually uh, is. Now, the style of this stonework um, that we have left, the older stuff, did not remain exactly the same. I spoke briefly about before about how it developed from a kind of jumbled, rounded set of mounds into something that was a little bit more carefully put together. But there are a number of different stylistic uh, uh, waves of improvement, you might say, that came along uh, as the region developed uh, over time. One of them, and I won't tell you about every single one, um, uh, came along uh, with the so-called colonial revival. This was a period in the late 19th, early 20th centuries when um, uh, various civic organizations decided that uh, it was time to spruce up the New England village and return it to the integrity and the beauty that it had been supposed to possess uh, back in uh, colonial times, pre-revolutionary and the revolutionary year. And this is when, um, uh, for some reason, it really doesn't have much to do with the facts, uh, everyone decided that the New England village had to be white and that its houses would all be painted white, and that the town green would be spruced up and turned from the sort of muddy, stable place that it had been in actual colonial times into a kind of, excuse me, central uh, uh, growing area that, uh, that had a lawn on it, or uh, a monument to the Civil War soldiers, uh, or something like that. It really stood as the sort of civic center of the town. Um, this was the period when um, Folks decided that they needed to put uh, nice stone walls around the old cemeteries, for instance. And by, by then, um, notions of what uh, proper stonework ought to look like uh, had actually changed from the uh, colonial period. Uh, now, because of, again, uh, because of the technology of cutting stone, which had been undergoing steady improvements throughout the 19th century, Many of these old graveyards, for instance, in town commons were now enclosed with cut block work, in other words, rough 
dressed uh, slabs of granite, either sitting over uh, um, a fitted field stone or uh, making up the um, structure entirely by themselves. So we add the kind of layer of much more highly developed stonework uh, in, uh, during this era. At the same time, uh, in places like Wolfboro up north and Dublin uh, and uh, other places, I'm sure here in Massachusetts too, near lakes, um, uh, the vacationing rich from the city where they got to buy some of the old properties and turn them into summer resorts for themselves, brought yet another sort of style of stonework. And this was a, uh, a style of stonework that was produced by professionals from places like Italy and Greece uh, and, of course, Ireland. And this, uh, these styles were uh, quite different uh, in many ways from what you were seeing from the farmers themselves. And now, of course, some of that work uh, has been standing for so long that it has turned into the part of the landscape as well. So this kind of overlay of different styles that occurs uh, as time goes on. In the 1920s and 30s, when it became evident that we were going to be a nation of automobile drivers, uh, uh, yet another uh, event occurred in terms of <coughs> the development of stone walls, and this was the improvement of country roads, which often involved dragging big stone crushers up the roads and pounding the old stone walls that ran alongside them uh, into submission, smashing them up into uh, very small pieces and then pounding them into the road surface itself in order to macadamize or uh, create a hard surface for car travel. This is one of the reasons why uh, in many parts of the countryside, the, the stone walls that run along the sides of the road, which used to be four to five feet tall, are now two or three stones high uh, and barely visible. It's also responsible for a phenomenon you might have seen here and there, which is that you're driving along a country road, there's a nice stone wall along the side of it, and all of a sudden, in the middle of that stone wall, sitting on top is a gigantic boulder, and you can't figure out how the old farmers could possibly have put that huge boulder, perhaps the size of a Volkswagen, um, onto the wall itself. The truth is that boulder wasn't placed by the original builders of the wall, but rather by a road crew in 1932 or 1928, who came along with their steam shovel, uh, or their crawler, and dug out this big whale back from the middle of the dirt road, and not knowing any other place that was convenient to put it, simply picked it up with their machine and plopped it down in the middle of the, of the old wall that ran along the, ran along the road. Um, uh, now, of course, in a distance of 80 or 90 years, it looked as though it was there originally. But this is just another example of the ways that uh, some of the old work that we see around us uh, is, um, is changed over time in ways that we may not be able to immediately see when we look at it. <coughs> I'm going to leave the history part there, so I'm going to remind you now to remember to please come back to me, ask me anything that I've skipped or um, uh, have not addressed, uh, and I want to talk briefly now about uh, technique. I mentioned before that these walls are put together uh, without mortar, and so the stones are actually simply placed on one another uh, and then uh, expected to stay. The basic principle of building this way is to, I'm sure some of you have heard this, is to place one stone <coughs> over two, you've heard this haven't you, or two over one, in other words not to stack them up right on top of one another. All right? The reason for this is that stone walls, any dry stone structure, is a, is a dynamic unit. It has to exist in terms of multiple structural dependencies, not just single ones. That's because of two simple facts. One of them is that every stone has an ambition. Okay? Every stone has an ambition to sink to the center of the earth as soon as possible. <laughs> it's an ambition that will follow forever, relentlessly. Stones are far more patient than you and I. Because of this, the other fact uh, is also very important, and that is, this is a fact not everyone knows, stone walls are in a constant state of motion. We think of them as still things, but they are not. 
always moving. If you could see a 150 year time lapse film of an old stone wall, you would, it would remind you at some times of a recently disturbed ant nest. You would see constant little movements, little flicks going on all the time as the stones are disturbed by frost underneath, the little 2.3 earthquakes we have all the time, um, water eroding uh, one area but not another, something falling on them. The number of things that can disturb a stone wall or move it just slightly uh, are many. When that movement occurs, all the stones in the wall sense an opportunity to follow their ambition. In other words, to sink a little bit lower. In a wall that's built not terribly carefully, where there's a lot of space between the stones, where they're not tightly fitted together throughout the wall, there's an opportunity for those stones to move just a little bit. And if they can slide slightly uh, and get a little bit lower, they will. This is why they're always moving. And it's why when my uncle was training me to build walls, he did not allow me to lay any stone that showed for a period of about five years. Um, it wasn't that he didn't like what I did. When I did put a stone in that showed, it was that he wanted to train me uh, in the proper art of fitting and placement. Uh, and the best way to do that was to make it <coughs> one who filled in the middle. Now the old farmers were not nearly so careful about this as we are now. And the reason for that was that they primarily were interested in putting walls together to either create the barriers that they needed for livestock or boundaries or whatever their purpose was, and also to get rid of the stone. So one of their techniques, for instance, we were talking earlier about an eight foot wide uh, wall. Now, now no wall needs to be eight feet wide, right? Isn't, there is no task that requires a wall to be that wide. Now why is it that wide? Is that wide because the, the ancillary purpose, the secondary purpose of building in the first place was to get rid of the stone, to get it out of the way. And so many of these walls were built by simply laying out two parallel lines of fairly large stones to create a kind of trough. And then over time, what was coming out of the fields and, um, adjacent to them would simply be thrown into that trough. Well, in a successful farm where generations continue to work it every day uh, and bring more stone on an annual basis out of those fields, sooner or later that trough is going to fill up. When it filled, they would get two more lines of large stones and place them on either side of the existing wall to create two new troughs, one on either side. Then they would fill those. This, of course, tends to make the wall wider and wider. We've excavated old in-between field walls that ran up to 20 feet wide and had four to five different outside faces all embedded inside them. This is the sign of a farm that was relatively successful. Uh, for a very long time. It's not, it doesn't happen in every farm, of course, but wherever you see a very, very wide wall, you can be sure that whatever was being done on that farm was working uh, economically for a fairly lengthy period of time. Where the walls are less wide, uh, where a, you know, a, uh, a filled or uh, what we call a containment wall, one, one primarily built to uh, to hold as much stone as possible, where they're a little bit narrower, then the farm was not in business for as long as some of those other uh, places. So that's, that's just one way where you can uh, draw some conclusions about what happened on the land from what you see in the, in the walls themselves. Now as far as uh, type uh, goes, I'll, um, I'll get through this pretty quickly. There are really, from a structural standpoint, there's really only two kinds uh, of stone walls. We see a lot of variety in the walls around New England, and it seems as though there must be uh, a great many types. But if you build them, uh, and you think about how they are put together, you really see that there's only two. One is, one is what I'm doing here, which is um, a free stand, what they call the freestanding type. It rises off the ground into space and shows sides. Uh, and shows two sides. The other is, the, of course, the retaining wall, which only rises into space on one side and is backed up into 
uh, a higher grade on its other side. All stone walls are variations of one or the other of these two kinds. Any freestanding wall, for instance, like the old single stack walls that are only one stone thick that you see running along the side of the road, those are all freestanding. Retaining walls, of course, we use them now in landscaping mostly, but retaining walls are also what a foundation is. A foundation is a retaining wall. So is a stone lined well, it's just a round one. Um, uh, ramps uh, into barns, causeways. Uh, over wet areas. Sometimes they are freestanding, and sometimes if they're wide enough, they're really two retaining walls backed up against each other, sitting back to back. Um, the reason that this matters is because of what we call the footprint. The footprint is the part of the wall that is sitting <coughs> on the ground. Uh, the, and this is critically important because unlike um, uh, frost or other enemies of wall, uh, the primary uh, thing that makes walls fall down, again because of the ambition of individual stones, is their own weight. And that means that how you handle where it sits and how it sits uh, matters a great deal. We talk a lot now about whether or not we should dig a trench under a wall and fill it with something hard to keep the wall from compressing too much. The old timers uh, didn't do very much of that. Most of the time they simply built the wall directly on the ground. Uh, and then simply allowed it uh, to sink in uh, as time went on. And if it developed problems because of that, they would simply uh, repair them. The notion of digging a trench under a wall uh, is one that was associated with formal architecture um, in the very early days of stone building, centuries and really millennia ago. Uh, but it's not one that came commonly to uh, New England builders who, after all, tended to be as uh, efficient as possible about what they were doing uh, at the time they were doing it. And so um, uh, one of the results of this that we see, uh, first sloppy building in the middle, and second uh, failure to do much formally underneath some of these old structures, that's really responsible for uh, a lot of the deterioration that we see in some of the older uh, stonework we have now. For instance, have you ever seen a wider wall, a double-faced wall, freestanding? <coughs> in which the outside uh, faces are uh, at a relatively high height, but the inside kind of scoops down. That it's not um, flat all the way across. This usually is a sign of, of throwing in terms of what is going, going on in the middle. Because of course over time, if you simply throw stones into a, uh, a space, you're leaving a lot of space around them, and as they move all the time, that, that interior uh, uh, part sinks down uh, a little bit faster than the more carefully placed stones on the outside. Um, uh, and so we get troughs in the middle of a lot of these walls. Now it's not always easy to tell if that's the result of sloppy building or just the, the possibility that the um, uh, trough was never completely filled up. And this is something you should think of when you look at some of these older walls too, the, the possibility that they were never actually finished. In 1871, for instance, when wall building was essentially uh, uh, ceasing to be a common activity of everyone who uh, worked on a farm, uh, a great many walls were, had been started but never, never were finished. On my own property in Hopkins, for instance, there's a wonderful 1,600 foot uh, magnificent old single stack wall that comes running up the hill um, uh, near to my house and then just stops dead. And uh, what picks up there is a bunch of old rusty barbed wire. So there's no question that the builder of the wall, who um, had some other temporary barrier um, uh, at the place where the wall stopped, uh, abandoned wall building altogether at some point uh, not long after barbed wire appeared on the scene and kept his cows in uh, with the wire only. Uh, after that, never really completed uh, what he set out to do in the first place. Um, so it's always a possibility that what you're looking at that looks tremendously deteriorated or just comes to an end uh, was actually not uh, ever completed. Now I'm going to, uh, I could rattle on about technique for uh, quite a long time, but I just wanted to give you some sense uh, of what it takes to put together a piece of dry stonework that's got a reasonable chance of staying for, a, for as much time as uh, as it possibly can under the circumstances that it's in. I want to talk just briefly about what walls have begun to mean uh, to the New England landscape. Have you ever noticed, you know, you don't uh, have this 
great pleasure here in Massachusetts, but um, I'm sure you're aware that every four years um, uh, the state of New Hampshire becomes temporarily insane as we uh, go through the uh, uh, exercise in political hysteria known as the New Hampshire primary. One of the things that I always notice um, about political commercials is how often candidates try to associate themselves with stonework. Um, the best example this past season was um, uh, the admirable Governor Richardson of Arizona. Arizona's a desert, right? <laughs> You've got stonework there, but it's in the form of pueblos under cliffs. Um, Richardson put a commercial on the air, maybe some of you saw it, in which he is clearly walking up a road somewhere in rural New Hampshire, virtually beside a nice old stone wall, talking about, you know, how he's going to fix the country and all those nice things that he said about himself. But this happens over and over again. Not only candidates, uh, but other, other people and other things try to associate themselves with what they consider and what we tend to think about. Uh, without really thinking uh, about what these walls mean. We tend to associate them with, uh, with hard work, with integrity, uh, with perseverance, with a lot of other qualities that we um, uh, would like to be associated with. You may also uh, have noticed that car companies are, are very anxious to associate themselves with stone walls. Very often you see the, the car they're trying to sell you being driven up a pretty country road right beside uh, a nice old stone wall. These are subliminal messages that have something to do with what is understood to be the symbolism uh, of stone walls. I want to. Um, I want you to imagine what we would, uh, how we would relate to the New England landscape if they weren't here. Because even though we've lost so many of them, uh, and so many are coming down all the time to make room for new development, there's still a great, um, uh, there's still a great attraction for them, and and. Uh, uh, they're still uh, now being built all the time, although in somewhat, a, somewhat of a different fashion than they once were. Um, you know, we went into business in the um, uh, early 1970s, and in our area, we were the, uh, the only people uh, to speak of doing uh, this kind of traditional or restoration work on older structures. But as the building boom of the late 70s and into the 80s and so on accelerated, um, uh, we were surprised to not only see uh, how quickly uh, people began to uh, decide that stone walls were an essential part of what they were going to uh, build when they put up a new house, but also how quickly the uh, commercial world responded uh, to this new development. Uh, it really, in a, in a period of uh, just a little over 15 years or so, virtually every landscape company in the area uh, began to teach itself how to build uh, in stone. And, the, um, uh, the, the craft has uh, enjoyed quite a renaissance uh, since then. Even with what we have that's new, uh, which is mostly decorative work around homes and so on and so forth, the older work is still a defining feature of the landscape, even though we've lost so much of it. So I want you to, uh, I want you to think about how you would relate to the difference, per se, between a field and a, and a, uh, and a forest, or. Um, how different the country roads would look if those walls were not there. That sense of barrier, that sense of of the difference in purpose from one place to another. Because you know, one of the things I argue in my book is that is the thing that makes a stone wall look like it belongs in a place is a, the palpable sense that it is doing some kind of job, that it has a practical purpose of some kind. It's not merely decorative. We sometimes get into arguments with our clients who insist that uh, they, they want to plop down a wall just to have a wall. My analogy is, is uh, like a good dog um, lying in the front yard to create a kind of sense of ownership. But, you know, it is possible to put up walls that look like they don't belong in a particular place. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to give them nothing uh, to do. In other words, to make it not make it clear enough that what um, that the reason the wall is there is because of some practical purpose. I don't keep the keep the baby from wandering into the road, or protect the garden from the deer, uh, or some other uh, task that's associated uh, with an older way of uh, regarding the landscape. There's one other very funny thing about the way that we look at the New England landscape now too that we often run into with our clients. You know, I spoke 
uh, briefly about uh, how different some of these older walls were when they were first built. For one thing, they were quite a bit taller, uh, quite a bit larger than they are now uh, in many instances, uh, and somewhat more, uh, somewhat better put together, and they were more tightly fitted, not wandering. As you know, walls are like people, they tend to spread as they get older. Uh, and so their, their bases wander a little bit, their lines. Uh, which may have been straight when they were first built, uh, uh, begin to uh, move a little bit, especially if they're on side hills and, uh, and so on. Um, but, you know, sometimes when we go to build a wall for a client in a place where no wall has stood, the client will say something like, make sure you don't make it look too nice. And what they're really, what they're really asking us is to imitate the deterioration that they have become used to. Um, the fact is that the older walls around the uh, countryside are mostly in not terribly good shape because they've wandered or changed or their stuff has been stolen from them or they're, they're just not what they were. And yet that look um, has become what we are now used to. Um, and so uh, we actually had to teach ourselves uh, to produce walls that appear to be on their last legs um, and ready to fall down uh, when in fact they are uh, structurally sound. This creates a look that our clients, some of them, feel is right. Uh, and so it is not just the walls themselves that has changed over time, it is our perception of the landscape and of what is truly New England uh, that has a great deal to do with how we look. Now I'm going to stop spieling here and uh, ask you to fill in the gaps. Any questions? How do you deal with brownstone? Well, it depends on what you're building. You know, if you're building a deep retainer um, uh, that uh, can accommodate a lot of uh, badly shaped stone, um, it's very it's not very difficult to use the uh, to use that rounder stone as uh, interior packing. But one of the uh, one of the things about wall building is that a smaller, more petite wall is is um, more difficult to build. It has to be placed a little bit more carefully. Uh, when we are teaching students, we often tell them that uh, they mustn't feel that they've got to use every stone they bring. We routinely bring about 30 percent more on a volume basis to a given job than we are actually going to use. That is to give us enough choice. I think one of the mistakes that people make when they first try to teach themselves to do this is that they feel, they try to obligate themselves to use every stone that comes to hand. This is not what, um, uh, that's, this is not the most efficient way to do it. Um, and so the short answer to your question is uh, if the project will accommodate stone that is badly shaped, the stone will not uh, fit well with others, doesn't play nice with others. Um, uh, then you shouldn't feel obligated to use it, and you should discard it um, if, it, if the job will not handle it, and go get something better. Yes? What uh, form of, I guess you could say, New England ingenuity, I think that's where it came from, I assume that's part of what started, how do they handle the, the weight of it? Just to take it we, you know, we develop techniques here in New England because our stone is a little different than what you find in other parts of the world. Uh, if you're building in Kentucky, you're building with um, uh, rough quarried limestone out of, uh, uh, out of outcropping that uh, breaks into fairly um, uh, convenient uh, uh, squarish type shards. If you're building the <coughs> district of the British Isles, the uh, schist over there is shattered into some fairly contiguous series of smaller shapes. It's a little bit easier to deal with. The thing that sets New England stone apart is its incredible diversity. I mean, just from town to town, you could go from uh, all rounded water, uh, you know, water worn stuff to shattered big chunks of uh, granite or, uh, or schist or other stuff, or some kind of bizarre mixture of all of them. One of the things I think that distinguishes the older work is, is what you call ingenuity, which is something they train themselves to do in terms of, in terms of handling that kind of variety of uh, shapes. As far as moving large weight, their main tool was something we don't have as much of anymore, and that is 
patience. Um, you know, what we've discovered in studying older stone work is that the builders of that work had a very different relationship to the passage of time than we do. Um, my uncle always said to me, if you can move it an inch, you can move it a mile. And that's correct. You, know, you can, you know, all by myself with a six foot iron bar, I can move a two ton stone. I can just move it, you know, I can move the end of it about three or four or five inches if I have a piece of bait underneath my bar. And then I go to the other end, I can move that in another two or three inches. If I spent four or five hours on it, I can get it six feet across the field. They were just, uh, they didn't even have rope. Oh, sure they had rope. They had yeah. rope, they had chain. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had horses, they had oxen, they had levers, sleds. they had sleds. That's right. That's right. In foundation work, where you see a great big giant stone six feet off the ground in a foundation, one thing you have to remind yourself, is, although when you look at, the look at the stone in the foundation, you think, how did they get that up there? But they built from above, in, down into the hole. Um, uh, when they uh, built those foundations most of the time. And so that stone did not go up into place, it came down into place. So part of, part of understanding how they moved such large uh, pieces of material is understanding um, how it got to the spot that it was sitting in. In terms of wall work, where you see a stone that no, no human or group of humans could pick up, remember that a wall doesn't go up all at the same time. It has a low end and a high end. And one of the things that you can do when you find yourself in a proportionally enormous stone is to simply bar or chain <coughs> it up um, onto one stone and then onto two and then slowly move it across until you're in the right uh, place. There's been a lot of injuries back then. I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, uh, but the uh, uh, but the patience factor and the, and the uh, taking the time to do what you have to do because it has to happen that slowly is a, is a major factor in moving that much weight. Um, they had a lot of other little techniques for dealing with great big huge stones. So one of those is to break them into smaller hand little pieces. Um, in terms of large boulders in the fields, um, there were various techniques for um, breaking them up into smaller pieces. Sometimes they would cut, the, uh, cut them out of defense posts after the middle of the 19th century when we went to the feather and wedge system, which was a little more efficient than what we had before. They were able to cut fence posts out of huge granite boulders and so on. If none of that worked or it was simply too large, often what they would do was dig a hole beside the stone and just go down deeper than the stone and undermine it gradually until it fell into the deeper hole and was, and was below the place where it needed to be. Um, uh, so they, there were a lot of different ways they used uh, to handle um, uh, great and heavy weights. And what they accomplished looks amazing to us now at this distance because the, that work is done. But, you know, to spend three or four weeks, a few hours at a time, moving something like that really occupied an enormous amount of their, uh, of their energy. And it's all, I think it's all the more impressive because stonework is not a seasonal thing like, um, like slaughtering or haying. There's no time of the year uh, when uh, everybody says, okay, let's go to the stonework. It's a filling thing uh, that can happen at various times, uh, even in cold weather if you've stockpiled your, uh, your materials. Yes. If you have a farm and you work it, you remove the top layer of stones. Now, as the plow goes along, it's going to hit new stones. Can you, can you talk, do these stones keep coming up and just frost? Well, they, 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 appear, they appear to be coming up. Um, then they're, still they're still trying to sink down. What happens is that this is the great phenomenon of the New England potato, right? Um, what happens is in, a, in land where it's been plowed over, when the, where the root cover is gone because it's been plowed. Um, and by the way, we, we made the roots a lot stonier than it is, especially in upland areas, by stripping the forest away from the hills. When we did that, uh, we caused enormous erosion uh, off uh, hilly areas that exposed underlying uh, stone. And that is one of the reasons why, by the middle of the 19th century, so much of upland uh, New England was not tillable anymore. It was because of our activities. However, what happens is that in the winter the ground freezes, right? And, and it freezes around the stones. Now, stones and earth hold cold and heat at, and lose it at different rates. So when the spring comes and, and the soil loosens and the frost goes out of the soil, there's still a little band because the cold doesn't leave the stone as fast. 
there's still a little band of frost um, in that, those late stages, right around the stone, between the stone and the soil. So the stone, as the soil unfreezes, the stone stays a little bit more frozen in place for just a little bit longer. When that happens, the, uh, you know that when water in something freezes, it expands, right? So everything in, all around the stone and in, in the soil has expanded as it has frozen hard over the winter. But when the uh, soil unfreezes, it shrinks slightly, and it shrinks, starts to try and shrink away from the stone, especially underneath it. That creates a little space between the stone and the earth underneath it. As the uh, melting and the water uh, move uh, out of the earth, they, the water trickles down under the stone and it takes a little bit of earth with it. So now there's a little bit more earth directly under the stone than there was before. And that means that when everything is unfrozen, the stone's a little bit higher than it was last year. So they do move up then. So they get pushed, they move up, but what's really happening is that the soil is moving down away from them. They're staying in the same place. Right through my driveway. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But this is a thing that happens only in, this, you don't see this phenomenon in the woods, for instance. Stone is not rising to the surface of, uh, uh, in wooded places where there's, where there's heavy root cover, because that's holding it down. It's only happening in a chilled field. So this is a, this is a consequence of agricultural activity. But it also happens in roads. I've seen it. It happens under roads because we plow the roads. We didn't plow the roads. That frost wouldn't go in underneath the uh, asphalt. You know, and especially in recent decades, uh, as our winters have gotten warmer, uh, and there's no question that they have, frost is not striking as deep into the soil as it once did. So um, this phenomenon, uh, although it was the bane of the existence of farmers generations ago, is somewhat less pronounced now than it once was in our part of the country. Yes, ma'am. Uh, would you speak a bit about uh, stone walls and their relationship to people's boundaries, property lines? Well, uh, walls have often been used as boundaries, and another thing that happens in New England, of course, is that stone walls become boundaries, uh, where they weren't originally. Um, you know, in the, in the early 19th century, we had a, um, uh, the uh, phenomenon, which is quite, quite New England, of the single stack wall, which is just a one stone wide uh, wall, came along. Um, uh, for uh, a couple of reasons. One is that um, uh, we had what we call the sheep craze here, uh, where we suddenly decided that we would get rich raising merino sheep uh, after they were imported into this country. And the raising of sheep requires a lot of enclosed land. You know, and so uh, we found ourselves in a position of having to enclose enormous amounts of land in a very short time. Uh, the single stack wall uh, uh, serves this purpose beautifully because although it doesn't use up very much stone, it actually uses the least amount of stone of all the uh, variations of stone walls that we have, it can be built very, very quickly. So gangs of uh, professionals would go around the countryside putting up rod after rod of uh, single stack wall. This um, type of wall, because it can be built so fast, was also favored for boundaries. Um, uh, and so um, uh, in uh, places where a farmer divided his land up among his sons, for instance, uh, and, and one larger plot from the original grant was turned into three or four uh, separate farms, often they would be bounded off from each other uh, with a quick single stack wall. Um, um, often in places where there was, there had, a wall had been planned for some practical purpose uh, uh, anyway. But, um, uh, and as, as uh, new development has, has taken over older areas, sometimes when uh, pieces are broken, uh, we mounted an enormous effort to eradicate this disease, which is a complicated uh, um, disease that is borne by gooseberries and currants before it attacks the pine. So it has a host. Uh, and so in the state of New Hampshire, they decided to eliminate every gooseberry and currant bush in the state. And they did it. And they did it. It's true in Massachusetts, too. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there was a program here. This in New Hampshire involved teams of, and, and in order to do this, they had to find out where, where all the gooseberries and currants were and where the pine was. And so uh, over, the, over decades, from the from late 20s all the way up into the uh, early 70s, they sent teams of people out to walk every inch of the state and draw, make hand-drawn maps of every inch of the state. And those guys, because gooseberries and currants, <coughs> 
um, uh, like little on stone walls accumulate there. They drew every stone wall in the state, starting in the 30s, and they would revisit areas about every 10 years and redraw everything. And those maps are all all still exist. They're in cardboard boxes in Concord. You can go and and look up your town. Towns are all broken into numbered grids. You can find your own property and look at what the pattern of settlement on, on it was in 1934, 1948, 1956, 1963, and they show everything. They show every wall. It's quite amazing. Where is that? This is, <laughs> <laughs> these, these are called the, the blister rust maps. Okay. They are in the State Archives building on Fruit Street in Concord, New Hampshire. You can walk in the door and say, show me Hopkinson. They will. Blister, why don't take this technology to uh, build a structure so they can build walls? I'm sorry, you can anyone use the technology to make any other structures besides walls? Like, uh, well, I don't, I don't know. Are, like that, I, yeah. I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. These are fitted together like jigsaw puzzles. You know, part of part of building a stone wall is, is really the art of learning to memorize negative space. You know? mm -hmm. One thing that we tell people who were first teaching to build is that you're often tempted to build backwards. You know, you have a pile of stone, you're going to make it into a wall, right? And so you go to the pile and you look for something that looks like a nice shape to, to put in the wall. Well, what's a nice shape? Well, okay, it's one that shows something on the outside that's attractive to see, and it's got enough depth to go back into the, into the mass and, and get gripped by all the stones around it so that it has as little chance as possible of moving. So you select a stone that you really like, and then you start to walk and look for a place to put it, right? And you look at it, and you walk over here, oh, that's no good. So you turn around, and you walk, it. Well, okay, you're going to walk all the way around this wall four or five times before you find a place to put it. This is backwards. What you really should do is look at the wall. What does the wall need? Find a space that needs a certain shape, then go look for the space in the pile. This is why old guys like me get more done than young guys. <laughs> it's one of the secrets of wall building. Find the space for the stone, then pick up the stone. Don't find a stone, because you're always tempted to, to go for a stone that you think is useful and looks good and you want to put it in there. But you'll kill yourself trying to find a space for a stone. <coughs> find the space first, and then go looking for the stone. You'll, you're using your energy efficiently. Yes? Do you, when you get a set amount of stone, based on what you just made a comment in reference to right there, uh -huh. do you first seek out, if you have a corner situation, do you seek out your corner stone first? Uh, you those two faces we'll certainly, uh, we'll certainly be mindful when we're acquiring the stone that that's what we have to do. Because 90 degree angles, as you might imagine, are not plenty in most runs of uh, New England field stone. Because most of the work that we do is either historic restoration or meant to look as though it were. Uh, uh, we do not cut. Many stone wall builders or stonemasons in general uh, cut or shape the stone that they use. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're in the restoration business or you want something to look like it was standing in 1785, uh, you don't want to cut and show fresh edges. So that means that you've got to select for the shapes that you need. The short answer to your question is, that, um, is one that you embedded in the question, which is that it really depends on the specificity of the project, uh, how fussy you're going to get about what you pick at the source. But one of the things that makes a new wall look like an old one <coughs> is the sense that the builder used what came to hand. The play, the area in which the older builders were exceptionally skillful was in figuring out ways to use what they had, rather than, as time went on, getting fussy, uh, as formal, more formal masons do, uh, about only showing particular kinds of shapes and particular kinds of patterns. So the, uh, the secret of making a new wall look like an old one is a kind of consistent placement of a large variety of different kinds of shapes. Mm -hmm. Follow-up question. Yeah. So, based on the restoration of a, of a new to look like an old, mm -hmm. it must be difficult sometimes to find stone with lichen, moss, etc. to do that. It can be. It can be. And there are, ways, there are ways to handle it. One of, 
one is sometimes if you've been at it for a while, you can uh, you know of places where uh, conditions are likely to produce the same uh, uh, look or feel, same color, uh, et cetera, that you're trying to match. Um, uh, what shows on the surface of stones is almost entirely due to not so much to what the stone is, but to the environmental conditions that it's been sitting in. Um, uh, 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 identical pieces of granite that are on the north or the south side of a hill that are under a tree or out in the sun uh, that are exposed to a lot of water or not uh, will develop different uh, patinas over time uh, from one another. If you can't match what you're trying to match in a restoration project where a lot of the stone has been in place for, for a long time, the best thing to do is to take the whole thing apart get as close as you can with what you bring that's new and rebuild it from scratch, mixing it all together so that there's no section that's clearly older than another or clearly different. If it's consistent when it gets put back together, the natural aging process of that environment will cause it all to look the same a lot sooner than if you simply plug in stuff that isn't quite the same. And since in many, many cases it's almost impossible to get exact matches of look, uh, that seems to be the best uh, uh, solution. Also, when you're uh, restoring, as opposed to simple repairing, which is really just picking up what's fallen, if you're restoring, then you're trying to put together something that expresses the original purpose of the wall, too. And that is, that's one reason why a restoration project almost always involves complete rebuilding. Yes? Uh, comment on, on uh, dry wall, retaining walls, and chip marks. Because <laughs> uh, I have some beautiful drywall retaining walls that are just infested with chipmunks, uh -huh. and, and I have stones falling out of them and everything else. Is, there, is that a common problem, and what do you do? <laughs> uh, first, let me ask you what, uh, how, how large and heavy is your wall? Is this a smallish sort no, of retaining wall? And, and, uh, there's, uh, there's one that's probably four feet high, and uh -huh. probably six feet high. And how large are the stones in it? Oh, they're varied sizes. Uh -huh. uh, it's a very old wall. There, there are different schools of thought on this. Um, we personally don't think chipmunks are wall destroyers. If stones are falling out of your wall, it's possible it's, that chipmunk activity is may be responsible, but the chipmunks go in between things. They don't, you know, they don't tunnel and make big burrows. They're not like woodchucks. They're not scraping stuff away. Um, we had a client once who insisted that after we had built a wall from that it was our fault that it, the chipmunks had moved in. Well, chipmunks regard stone walls the way the way you know they regard uh, engineers regard condominiums along Route 128. As soon as they're built, everybody moves in. <coughs> um, so tree tree roots are like the uh, bigger culture. <coughs> Much bigger. I have both in, in my mind. It's either the tree roots or the chipmunks are are killing these walls. <laughs> I think it's the roots. Okay. <coughs> the um, <coughs> excuse me. This is gonna go on for a minute. <laughs> Our solution for our uh, <clears throat> our client was to offer to bring her a bucket of snakes. <laughs> <laughs> she declined <laughs> <laughs> to get rid of the chipmunks. I really don't think chipmunks are major uh, wall destroyers, but if you've got tree roots too, that's that's, that's what's doing it. When you're building a retaining wall, I mean, I noticed as you were laying stones <coughs> in the end of this wall you're building, some you were laying in fairly deep, at different heights, like a dead man, right? Um, you, you had some of the, the stones that seemed to go nearly all the way across. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're building a retaining wall, you're starting off what uh, two thirds of the height is the width of the base, and you work your way up. But at, 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 the, at the higher heights, do you ever run any stone into the hillside to sort of tie it into the dirt, or is it just build it up as a always sloping? <coughs> Uh, two thirds to one is n is rather thin for a tall retaining wall. For any retaining walls okay. over four feet, say. Okay. We tend to build our retaining walls one to one uh, or more. Um, this is the result of excavating uh, uh, foundations, <coughs> which we found to be 
exceptionally heavy in terms of the footprint. We once restored a, um, an interior foundation under a carriage house that had eight foot high walls on the inside, but on the footprint back into the hill, there was laid stone 12 feet from the face all the way back in. Can you imagine what this means in terms of the excavation for the building in the first place? It means that the cellar hole that they originally dug was two or three times the size of what the finished basement was going to be. This happens quite a lot. If you want to see what uh, the old retaining wall philosophy was, look at the town, some of the old town pounds sometimes, which are really just foundations except out in the open completely. Often there's a big step down on the outside, the inside walls are vertical uh, to keep the animals in and keep them from uh, having any place to climb. <coughs> but uh, uh, because these structures are holding buildings up, that's why their footprints were so wide, so that there could be no distortion. You can't really anchor a wall to the dirt itself. The retaining wall needs to stand on its own, which is another reason why building them very heavy at the base and then and then building the inside line up in a kind of dam-like shape so it gets narrower and narrower as it reaches the top is a good idea. But laying longer stones uh, it, it, at any place in any wall that run back into the mass and can be gripped all around is a way to create a kind of zone of stability all the way around. They, they don't just anchor themselves because of the interdependence of the mass around them. They also uh, anchor everything that's in their vicinity. You can't put too many of those in a wall, but again, uh, sometimes your supply simply doesn't allow that, that sort of thing. Uh, when you have a choice, you should look for those longer stones uh, that are going to run back into the mass, because that, that um, principle I was talking about of 1 over 2 and 2 over 1 uh, does not just apply horizontally on the look of the face of the, of the wall itself, it also applies vertically uh, into the mass, um, because you know you're going to have to use a a considerable number of stones that do not have that kind of depth to spot ones that do uh, as evenly as possible <clears throat> throughout the project is the way to make something that's going to last for a while. So for retaining walls and foundations, did they, uh, like you're saying, take the trenches for a while? Did they typically do a trench for that as well? It would really depend on what the conditions were. Mm -hmm. You know, some places you try to put a shovel in the ground and if you hit 85 rocks. Yeah and then 120 rocks on the second shovel full. <coughs> Places like that, are, they're not really going to compress under any amount of weight. There's no place for all that weight to go. But if you're in a soft spot or, you know, if it's sandy or moldy, well, then you know you're going to get uh, an enormous compression if you build a, you know, a tight, heavy stone wall right on, or foundation right on it. And so those are places where you might want to consider putting a trench underneath. I know for my house, uh, for the, the cellar itself, so, uh, the pipe that it didn't go 12 feet from the edge of the foundation. It's yeah. Definitely more like uh, probably a foot. Oh, they're not all like that, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah and many foundations are built of very very large um, uh, stones. Oh, yeah, this one does like, yeah, it has big stones. Mm -hmm. stones are, like you said, probably pushed in. When they're very, very large, they tend to be a little bit less deep because those big, bigger stones are simply more stable in and of themselves. Yes, sir. Is there an advantage to using larger stones on a stone wall or a retaining wall at the bottom? I think so. Um, uh, larger stones, proportionally larger in terms of the project itself, are good in any spot, uh, in any wall. They're more stable, there's, no, there's less space uh, that you're building in. If they're on the bottom, um, uh, they, it takes more to press them in uh, than it does smaller stones. Um, what we see in older work uh, is a fairly often uh, uh, larger stones on the bottom, but also a fairly even distribution because large stones near the top of a wall are helpful too, because they press down on many, uh, not just a few, and so it's e it's not as easy to to dislodge either them or the stones in their immediate vicinity. Um, this is the philosophy behind the um, uh, 19th century thing of capping. Uh, uh, stone walls with long, uh, uh, rough cut granite slabs. They not only look nice and give a nice finished uh, look, they also clamp down on every single stone that's underneath them and actually make the wall itself more stable. So uh, larger stones are good anywhere uh, in a project. Yes? 
Is there a plus or minus to using wedges or wedge or rocks of those size between large rocks just to keep them in place? There are two ways to there are two techniques of, of doing this. One is one is called chinking, and the other one is called shimming. Okay, chinking is not generally good, and shimming is okay. If uh, often, you know, when you're placing an individual stone, it's just perfect in, in a, a particular spot, except that you'd like its tail to be a little higher. So if you put something in under the back side of its tail to hold it in place, and then make sure that you pack around that so that it can't move, because you remember, this is all going to move, right? So you don't want your little shim to go squirting out and then drop your, the thing that it's holding up. The problem is uh, the same thing that this gentleman is talking about. The smaller the stones you use, the more you're inviting uh, distortion later on. But ch uh, shimming happens from the back. It happens in a place where the piece cannot come out. Chinking happens in the face, where you have a gap you don't like, and so you go around after and you fill that with, just like putting a shard or some other thing in there. This is not a good thing to do. First of all, these, these little chinks are going to be the first thing to go on. And if they are uh, in any way um, responsible for structure, then you are already, you're building in a compromise to your structure. The best thing to do is to okay. take, take yeah, more chinking, care. That's chinking. That's chinking. Yeah, chinking happens out from the oh surface God. in at, after the project is done. Right. It's, tr it's pure <coughs> And, and it does not last. It, better to take your time and, and um, have a consistency of gappage you know, throughout your project that, where there isn't a hole or two that draws the eye. This takes a little bit of time to master. Is there a word for when people say concrete blocks and uh, bricks and things like that? Well, <laughs> ingenuity. <laughs> Desperation. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question that kind of alluded to the answer, but I didn't like the answer, so I'm going to see if I can listen to something. I'll give you a different one. Something <laughs> I built a stone wall about 30 years ago uh -huh. in front of my house, and it's still up for the most part, and I wanted it freestanding, yeah. but I, I was real glad to hear you talk about mending walls every year in fall, because it does, especially around here with the plows and stuff. Sure. But I find that now I've got stones that came down, maybe they're halfway or lower in the wall. Trying to get them back in, you start, you know, you got to move this one and that one. And, and, That's right. And I know you said basically start all over, but that was 30 years ago. <laughs> I don't want to you do it now. Don't you want to? <laughs> Don't you want to go back 30 <laughs> years and start to come on? Who doesn't want to go back 30 years and start over? Think of all the mistakes you're not going to make. <laughs> you can always do it a lot better the second time. The problem with um, trying to put one stone back in a wall is that when it leaves the wall, it leaves, the, it leaves its space different from what it was when it was there before. And so what you really have to do is recreate, not, you have to recreate the space. It, it, it's sort of a aphorism that you cannot build the same stone wall twice. Right. So what you are finding out is that when one stone goes, all the other stones that depended on it or that it depended on aren't in the same place either. Right. And so once to fix one stone is really to fix an area. Um, what we generally will do in this kind of case is very carefully dismantle a kind of rounded scoop in that area mm -hmm. and that and bring some extras mm -hmm. because when you start to fill that in again you're going to be creating a completely different pattern and, and, and that will that's the only way to make spaces that the stones you've got to handle fit but it won't be those exact same right. stones. I so, like that answer better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yes ma'am. You said you teach painters you mentioned several times when you teach where do you teach we teach fairly sporadically. Do you have an apprenticeship program? We don't. We are now old. And <laughs> we, we are fairly selective about, my uncle is 74 and my sister-in-law is um, uh, now in her mid-50s and busy with some other things. There are only three or four of us uh, at work um, at the moment. Uh, and so what we will do is we'll take on temporary help um, uh, for specific projects. 
uh, but we don't run an apprenticeship program. We have occasional uh, public workshops at my uncle's farm. We have given workshops at the New Hampshire Farm Museum uh, and other places from time to time. I sometimes teach a course of, of one day or two day intensive at the New Hampshire Technical Institute for landscape students, that, that sort of thing, but it's not regular. Yes? Well, those are following up with the questions because some of us come up and poke at what you've built there. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, sure. Please. Please do. Um, in your retaining walls, do you do any type of uh, filter fabric behind to prevent uh, it, it depends on what's going in behind that, but that's a good thing to, to um, uh, mention. In places where uh, the retaining wall, A, isn't very large, or it's backed up by sandy loam or something else that a uh, heavy, you know, two-inch overnight rain is going to wash out through uh, the surface, it is a good idea sometimes to buy those porous landscape fabrics and just lay them along the back side before you backfill a wall because it will, um, until enough stuff grows into that soil uh, back to, to um, uh, hold it steady. It will, keep, uh, it will keep too much from filtering out through. Um, the, uh, the material in back is going to filter in between the stones on the back side down in deep enough where it isn't going to freeze and start prying them apart. Um, uh, so that's usually not a problem in any kind of project where the uh, where the footprint is fairly thick and there's lots of stone between the face and where the, where the soil in back starts. Uh, but because we, we now build quite a few retainers that are relatively small, um, uh, as opposed to the great big farm type ones or foundation uh, type ones, uh, the landscape fabric can be a big help. Yeah, you're, you're well, right. would want that fabric to prevent any type of wash through. Right. And even in the, the tall yeah, some people will cap um, will cap a retainer hard um, uh, with something that's a little bit bigger, uh, but not necessarily that deep, uh, so that they can drop off um, on the back side of it down quite a ways and once too, which tend to attract people to sit on. And of course, stone walls are kid magnets, and so kids will will go and run along them, um, especially shorter ones. It's better to cap to cap relatively heavy. Are there walls about how high freestanding walls would be? Not that I know. I don't know. I, I'm not sure we, you know, we're the live free or die state. <laughs> <laughs> it gets really ridiculous. You were talking with all the politicians earlier. I know people think whether, well, you know, obviously there's well, a I think strong wall. Well, I think there <laughs> probably are building codes in terms of dry stone work in some places, but I bet there aren't any in the <laughs> <laughs> Is there a favorite kind of stone that you like to work with? No. No, not a favorite. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 after years of trying to handle everything that comes along, it's probably a good idea not to play favorite. You know, you can <laughs> you can get stones mad at you, <laughs> and uh, uh, and and so I would prefer not to have reports get back to the stones. <laughs> My favorite one, Elmer. I love them all. I love all my kids the same. <laughs> exactly the same. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, if you have, if you have an area where you have ledge, uh -huh. how is your treatment of tying wall possibly in or near that uh, ledge? We ran into this when we were, we spent some time a few years ago up at Acadia National Park. They brought us up to train their, their maintenance staff and a lot of the retaining walls they have along the carriage roads and, and other um, uh, trails up there are backed right up against heavy ledge. Uh, there's, you, you, you basically have to lean the wall against the ledge. Uh, if it's too, if, or if you've got to go up six feet, for instance, um, and you've only got two feet of lateral space, uh, it helps sometimes to batter the wall in. The battering is, is a slight lean to the face of the wall, so it's not straight up, it's just leaning to the back just a little bit. Um, this is a, not a perfect solution, uh, but it's better than nothing. Um, the other um, uh, part of the solution to this is to is to use uh, very large, the largest possible stones um, uh, because uh, that will fit into the area you're talking about because they're simply more thick. Uh, 
Brown versus Shad type. I'm sorry? Brown versus Shad in the contact of that lake. You would find it very edge. difficult to make um, efficient structural use of anything that was too round in a situation like that. You would need um, uh, shattered, angled stuff that's going to grip itself hard. Um, uh, uh, you know, because st depending on what their surfaces are like, stones are behave differently when they're when they're uh, uh, stacked against each other. So, um, you're talking about favorites. Um, if you're talking about structural integrity, then uh, the good old rough granite is about as good <coughs> as, you can, as you can get because it will not slide against itself uh, uh, very well. This is one reason, for instance, why in, in large retaining projects, we don't haul uh, everything that we're going to put in the invisible part, which is the the vast bulk of the wall. We'll call a we'll call a stone crusher and get 20 or 30 tons of uh, eight-inch riprap delivered to us. Riprap is the is the busted-up granite you see alongside the highways or technical <coughs> sites and so on. It comes in every size you can imagine. It's great as filler. It's ugly, but you never see it in a big retainer or even a a, a, a wide double face. And once it is carefully placed, because it is so rough. It cannot slide or move against itself uh, nearly as, as uh, readily as other kinds of stone. So where do you get stone like this? Well, um, not this small, but the size. Field stone like this? this? Well, it's sometimes tricky. You know, um, you can you can buy it on pallets from uh, all kinds of places, but now they're getting seven, eight, nine hundred bucks a ton for it. A ton of granite is not very much. Um, it's you know, granite weighs 165 pounds a cubic foot. And so a ton uh, is not uh, much in volume. We typically do projects that require 100 to 300 tons. Uh, and, and yet, you can buy uh, a ton or a, uh, you know, a ton of uh, broken up riprap for 8 or 10 bucks. So uh, that stuff's uh, really cheap for volume. But getting older looking stone, it de really depends. The most efficient way to do it depends on what your project is. If you're talking about something that's very large, um, uh, what we have done over time, and we've been in the same place now for almost 40 years, so we have a network of uh, people who are holding, uh, you know, old farmers and others who have uh, substantial amounts of back land with the old walls crisscrossing on them, because you can't dig stone out of the ground that looks like this. Uh, it's it, inevitably has got to come from some other structure somewhere. So yeah, we are not just builders, we are also, we are also plunderers. We're mm -hmm. trying to be even careful of where we plunder. Um, uh, and it's, of course, if you're going to take a, a large quantity, you usually, and you're going to haul it yourself, um, the, the price of the material goes down. But you know, it would be astounding to the people who built our old walls what the, those stones that they handled are now worth. They would find it astonishing. Yes? Um, how did your uncle learn? He learned from another old guy. He's been dead since not long after World War II. And that guy learned from another old guy who learned from somebody in the 19th century. Uh, how much of it is done by like picking apart old walls and just doing some analysis? I argue that this is largely a self-taught skill. And, you know, um, uh, it, it, there are basic structural rules that you should follow. And once you have those, it's really about personal practice. This is one of the reasons why, uh, among builders who've been at it for a long time, that there tends to be a signature style that develops. And that style has something to do with the individual with with preference for the placement of individual shapes. I'll give you one example. Now, you know, I was talking before about how how incredibly varied the shapes of New England stonework are, but those shapes also <coughs> fall into, you know, the basic pattern of shapes of all objects, which is to say some of them are rounded, some are square, and some are triangles, and some are trapezoids, and so on. This is a piece of flat stone. It has a parallel top and bottom. Very important in, in stone wall building. Okay, it's not, it's not thicker here than here. So it's top surface and its bottom surface are parallel to each other. So it presents a straight line. If I lay it in the wall like this, that line is parallel to the baseline of the wall, right? Where it hits the ground. Now, proportionally, this stone is fairly sizable and so 
There is no structural necessity for me to do that. But if that is the look that I prefer, every time, I, and it will become almost unconscious, you know, after a few years of doing, every time I run into a stone that I'm going to show that presents a line like this, I will tend to place it parallel to baseline. But I don't have to, because it's large. It's, it's not, now I'm another kind of builder. So I can present it like this, you know, and it would show a kind of egg. You don't like that, do you? <laughs> See, you're more like me. I can see a whole series of those. Along well, but you can do that, of course. You know, the, the great Dan Snow up in Vermont uh, builds deliberately with, with this kind of pattern, um, often. Um, but when you're trying for an older look, um, uh, you're, you're going to tend to, to uh, put stones where they'll do the most good in the wall. And so, uh, but over time, you're going to tend to be presenting certain kinds of shapes in certain kinds of ways. If all the stones that present a straight line like this are laid with their lines parallel to the baseline of the wall, it spots a kind of orderliness into the finished product that's consistent from end to end. If some of them are flat and some of them are straight up, you know, my uncle has a thing he loves to do. He'll take one of these, this is a little exaggerated. And then he'll find another one. He'll put it in like this. Right? He'll put it in straight up and down. Yep. And then he'll put a, another one over it. <laughs> Build this and puzzles crossing his T's. <laughs> right? This is his little joke. Uh, and then sometimes he'll put a sort of dot. And that's <laughs> dotting his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta do something to break up the day. Right? That's right. <laughs> oh, yes, you certainly do. Um, uh, but whether it's a triangle or square or trapezoid, what you'll find if you build a wall for a lot of uh, for a long time is that you almost unconsciously place certain shapes in certain ways all the time, and that is what gives you your your uh, wall a consistency of look. You know, in the old days when um, uh, uh, people were more used to looking at what this work really is, and, and we're a little bit more sensitive to pattern, you could, they could tell who had built a, a given wall by how its uh, individual stones related to each other. And I can tell you that our work, um, whether it's in Hollis, New Hampshire, or Sheridan, Connecticut, or uh, you know, Waterboro, Maine, um, uh, looks essentially the same. The builders are right, like printers are in the walls? <laughs> No, I, you know, you'd think that there would be sort of treasure troves of little stuff, but we're talking about incredibly frugal people. They <laughs> would not throw away things that were any good. Yeah. So what you usually find is, is a bud can from 1948. <laughs> yeah. Slight digression. Hmm. Can we have your opinion on Stonehenge in or pyramid? Uh, My opinion? Well, how they were built, you mean? They're awesome structures. <laughs> They're fantastic. What can I say? Um, you know, those standing stone monuments of that size are are amazing. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's a good opinion. <laughs> uh, the uh, pyramids, of course, are, are wondrous. Uh, Machu Picchu is beyond description. Um, uh, there's there's stonework that is uh, the the Roman aqueducts uh, uh, are mind blowing, you know um, uh, the east of the monumental um, head sculptures on Easter Island, are absolutely wondrous. Uh, I th I think there's you know that uh, human history endows stonework of that kind with magical qualities, and it's hard to argue that they don't exist. Yes. Uh, did the Romans maintain uh, just a one degree uh, angle going from the water from down? It was a very small graduation. Well, yeah, if, if you're going to transport liquid over those distances entirely by gravity, you, you have to. If you get too fast, you'd have to back up again. So they had a real. Yeah. They had a little, uh, yeah. I'm, a little I'm not an expert, but I, of course it would have to be. Yeah, it would have to be very gradual. They, some of those aqueducts run for, <coughs> what, hundreds of miles? Yes. Right, so if you're going to... I think I read that. 
You'd have to have the least amount of slope possible, otherwise you'd be in the ground long before you got to your destination. <laughs> and yet it would have to be going down pumps, all the time. Before you go back up. Actually, it had pumps. They had to move them back up just because they, you know, after a while they did run into the ground. So they would, so they would, yeah. Yeah, and they'd bring them back up again and let them run some more. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, it, to me it's a system that makes the engineering that we do now look sick. <laughs> It really does. There's so much thought about it. The, the, um, uh, the cathedrals in Europe are, are another like an example of astounding stone. You talked earlier about battering. Is there, yeah. you know, you built this wall here, there's no battering on it. It's, is there, um, aside from the case we talked about backing up against the ledge, mm -hmm. is there a time when you want to use battering on a two-faced wall? There's a debate about this among among builders. Uh, some builders favor battering and argue that it's structurally more sound because it tends to focus the weight back in on the wall itself. Um, historically, that theory doesn't stand up. Um, we prefer a vertical look because we prefer it aesthetically. But we argue that if it's properly built, it doesn't matter if it's battered or not. Um, uh, there are plenty of... Uh, the example I use in the book um, is uh, structures known as brocks, which are circular forts in the Shetland Islands that were built in the second century, which are um, which run to 30, 40 feet high. Uh, they would batter about the first 15 or 20 feet, and then on top of that, do another 13 or 14 feet of vertical. This is all dry work, and it's now closing in on 2,000 years old, and still standing. So. You seem to might have a couple more questions about because people probably want to talk to you sure. individually and buy your book. And, <laughs> and, 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 and well, let, before we all uh, shatter here, um, um, let me take this just quickly. Do you have anyone following your question? Well, I don't have children, so huh? the answer to that is no. no. But I have you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just quickly. <coughs> Is it your company that did the restoration in Waterboro, Maine at the Elder Gray Meeting House? No. In fact, we have never done anything in Waterboro, Maine. Um, uh, that was the first Gray? Maine town that came to my mind. We no. have <laughs> several things in Maine, but not in You found me now, and I'm just yeah. yeah. <laughs> We have been in Sheridan, Connecticut, however. Let me thank you very much thank for coming. Thank you. Uh, I think it might be that was my, my retaining walls were removed. Uh, I don't know who does that kind of work in this area. Just a regular road agent. That's a common town. Maybe a few people are doing that. I would talk to your public works The Granite Kiss, Traditions and Techniques of Building New England Stone Walls by Kevin Gardner.